the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that first Easter Sunday morning, and the immediate impact of those events. And so as we begin our time together, we, we prepare ourselves by singing of the Lord Jesus who still lives and reigns in heaven today. Please stand as we sing uh, with loud voices to make up for the choir. Alleluia. Sing to Jesus. Please do take a seat. And a sentence of scripture from Psalm 16, verse 10. You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. And Jesus' disciples weren't expecting his resurrection, but after the event, um, and after he told them um, all about himself in the Old Testament scriptures, then they would have looked back at a psalm like this and they would have realized that the verses I just read, spoken originally by King David, um, were saying more than they appeared to, saying more than even King David had expected. That he wasn't only talking about his own immediate circumstances and, and rescue from them, but that he was speaking words of prophecy about the Lord Jesus and his resurrection. Because Jesus Christ did lie in the grave, but he wasn't abandoned to the realm of the dead. And he wasn't abandoned to decay. And that means that despite how things sometimes appear for us, he won't abandon us who believe in him to those places either. 
and we can say, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. So we've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. And so after a moment's silence, we kneel or remain seated to pray the prayer of confession together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins, he pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray together with confidence as our risen Saviour has taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And we stand to sing a metrical Psalm 100, um, or we're still standing, after which we'll sit again unannounced. So, Psalm 100. <laughs> Yeah. 
first reading is Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous saviour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 28, verses 11 to 15. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. We heard there in our first reading the promise of a greater king, a king who would rule justly and share the name of the Lord um, as a righteous saviour. That ruler is Jesus Christ. And so we stand to declare our faith in him as we say the words of the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we sit or kneel to pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the King and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Our colic for this Sunday 
um, recognizes that Christ died and rose for our justification to, to make us holy in status with God. Um, but it also prays that because of Jesus Christ, God will be working in us to make us holy in substance. Um, that we'd be slowly putting away uh, the malice um, that we sometimes find in ourselves and growing in the purity that in our best moments we'd love to see in ourselves. And so we pray, Almighty Father, who has given thine only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification, grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve thee in pureness of living and truth through the merits of the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue to be led in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, our everlasting Father, we thank you, Father, for the verses from Matthew's Gospel where we see two choices, to believe that your only son, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead, or to be closed to the truth. Heavenly Father, help us to believe our righteous Savior's words. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We thank you, Father, for the truth you taught us through your prophet Jeremiah, that you would send a righteous savior and a king to bring us salvation. Heavenly Father, we pray for King Charles, that he is led by you, Lord, in all his endeavors. We pray your, healthy, your health, healing hand on King Charles and on the Princess of Wales. May they feel close to your loving presence. Lord, we pray for the Prime Minister and all those in government. Please bring light and truth into our country <clears throat> and into decisions made. May they be godly decisions, honoring to you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for the unity of the church, for our bishop, Rob Monroe, and for all church leaders, may they teach your truth and take godly responsibility for those they influence and lead. We pray for your wisdom and guidance for all world leaders. We pray for peace and reconciliation in all war-torn countries, especially Ukraine, Gaza, and Israel and for the relief of the oppressed throughout the world. Almighty God, we continue to pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in those nations where Christians are persecuted. We thank you for their steadfast faith and courage. May they know your comfort and peace. Heavenly Father, we pray for those in our church family who are sick, in grief or in sorrow, and for those unable to come to church at this time. We remember before you this morning, Pam, Doreen, Carol Ann, Angus, Andre, and his mother. In a moment of quiet, we pray for those known personally to us.
We pray that the Lord's peace and comfort will fill their hearts. We thank you, Father, for our church family that you have established and prospered here at St. Simon's. We thank you for Mike and Joe, who faithfully teach your word, for our music directors, Daniel and Chris, and for our choir. We thank you, Lord, that so many children attend our Sunday school, and we thank you for the team that lead them to Christ. We commit Joe and the morning sermon into your loving hands, and we pray your blessing on the evening service. Dear Father, may we trust in Jesus alone, and may we have the hope of eternal life secured by him. We pray all these things according to your will in and through our Lord Jesus Christ for our good and for his eternal glory. Amen. Uh, just a few things to draw your attention to on the back of the order of uh, service. Um, the first is that the church build building is closed for three days this week. So if you're in the habit, as I know some are, of coming in here uh, to have a quiet moment to pray, please do check uh, the dates there, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the, the building will be closed. But we're back open again uh, from next weekend on Saturday. Um, also, I won't say anything more about the annual church meeting. All of the details are down there, except to encourage you to, to come along to that, to plan to stay a little bit longer after the service uh, so you can participate. And if um, you consider St. Simon's your church, but you're not yet on the electoral roll, um, and you, you could qualify to be so, uh, so that it would be possible to be, uh, take part in that, that annual meeting, then um, please could I encourage you to have a chat with uh, Susan, who is just leading our prayers a moment ago after the service. She has some electoral roll forms and can take you through that process. We'd love you to be um, on the uh, electoral roll membership of the church. And now um, we return from electoral roll to, to even greater, much deeper things. Um, the person who trusts Christ can say, Jesus lives and so shall I. Uh, we sing Jesus lives thy terror now.
O Lord, open your word to us and open us to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Please do take a seat. Um, So I don't know if, like some members of my own family, you're big royal watchers, um, but but if you are, um, then you might have been following in the last couple of months um, something that's uh, already come to be known as Kategate. Um, So uh, back in mid-January, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, um, went into hospital. Um, A notice went out that she was having planned abdominal surgery. Um, and that she wouldn't be back in the public eye until after Easter. Um, And she came out of hospital uh, a few days later, um, but there was no photographic um, evidence for that. And so uh, straight away, um, alternative stories uh, started to circulate, alternative explanations for why uh, she wasn't being seen in public. Um, So uh, the the hashtag on X, if if that's something you you follow, um, where is Kate, um, racked up more than two million uh, shares. Um, And and some of the stories that were floating about included that maybe she was about to uh, divorce Prince William. Um, Some suggested that she'd actually been murdered by the royal family. Um, And... um, Even when some grainy photos did appear a little bit later, um, some claimed online that um, they were photos of a a body double. Um, So everybody agreed that that Kate wasn't being seen in public, um, but there were wildly divergent uh, views as to why that was. And and the palace said, look, those are are hoaxes. Uh, Some of them are even being pushed by uh, foreign states in an effort to destabilize Western institutions. Um, But others said, well, of course, the palace would say that. Um, And and the rumor mill continues now. Um, And the same is true with the absence of Jesus' body from the Easter tomb. Um, So Josh McDowell, a Christian author and one-time skeptic, um, he puts it like this. After 700 hours of of studying this topic, um, I've come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most wicked, heartless hoaxes ever foisted upon the minds of men or is the most fantastic fact of history. Um, The resurrection was a hoax, or its history. Fake news or good news. And both those explanations appeared the very first Easter Sunday morning. Um, So we see that in our passage from Matthew's Gospel on page four of the Order of Service. Um, Verse 11, straight away we have a tale of two reports. So two groups leave the empty tomb, uh, the women, and some of the guards, from which we can assume there are a decent number of them, uh, both agree the tomb was empty, but by the end of that morning, two different stories are circulating to explain why it was empty. Um, Now, last week, uh, Mike made the claim that it's reasonable to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And unsurprisingly, uh, I agree with that. Um, The resurrection can't now be proved beyond all reasonable doubt, like we're in uh, a court case, as Rebecca McLaughlin said in the excellent Easter book we have in the back. Uh, We're too late to the historical crime scene for that. Um, And nor can we prove it scientifically. Um, We're dealing with a a supernatural intervention into the uh, ordinary pattern of nature, not not something that's repeatable within that pattern. Um, But unless, uh, as Mike said last week, we start with the pre-assumption that the resurrection isn't possible. We start with the pre-assumption that God doesn't exist and that therefore um, there can't be any interventions in nature. Uh, If we begin instead by trying to be neutral on the question of the supernatural as much as we can uh, and just consider the claims in their own right, then we can say that belief in the resurrection is reasonable, is plausible. And today... I hope we can go just one little step further and ask two questions of the empty tomb that I think we'd ask of any news story, that we'd ask of of Kate Gate or anything else. What's more plausible and how will I respond personally? Uh, So so is the the resurrection more plausible than the alternative explanations around at the time? Uh, And how will I respond personally? 
And I hope that will be helpful for all of us, um, whether we're, we're skeptics, um, not kind of convinced about the resurrection, or whether we're Christians who sometimes feel unsure about it, sometimes waver, um, or just want to think a bit more about it. Um, so um, we're going to begin with that plausibility question. Is the resurrection more plausible than the alternative explanations for the empty tomb that were out there at the time? Um, because we, we, we can't look at all the alternative explanations uh, this morning. Um, if, if there's any you'd like to talk about, I'd love to chat about them over coffee. Uh, but in our passage, Matthew does report one alternative, um, the earliest one that we know of, um, and the only one that's explicitly mentioned in the New Testament, uh, the stolen body theory. Um, so he claims uh, that the chief priests and the elders, um, hearing the, the breathless report that the tomb was now empty, uh, hearing it from some of the guards who, who'd been placed there by those chief priests uh, just the night before, um, hearing about the earthquake and hearing about the angels and hearing the message uh, that, that Jesus was apparently risen from the dead, they huddle, in verse 12, to devise a plan. And they gather a large sum of money and they bribe the soldiers and tell them, uh, verse 13, you were to say, and here's that theory, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Um, And the guards are understandably afraid um, that they'll be in trouble for sleeping on duty. If they were Roman soldiers, then the penalty for that was was execution. Um, In any case, losing a prisoner, especially a dead one, uh, gets you in trouble. Um, And so the chief priests promise verse 14, that if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him. Um, Which probably hints that they were planning to bribe Pilate as well. Um, The Jewish historian Philo uh, reports that Herod, uh, sorry, not Herod, Pilate was uh, famously corrupt. And so the guards agree, and Matthew tells us this stolen body story starts circulating. And, And verse 15, really interesting note, he says it continues circulating among the Jews to this very day. So circulating to the day that Matthew is, is writing in, about 30 to 50 years later, to a mostly Jewish Christian audience who at that point was still mingling with other Jews in the synagogue and starting to sometimes get thrown out and, and probably facing this accusation themselves and wondering what to do with it. Um, And as it happens, it must have been quite a persistent story uh, because we know that the second century Christian writer, uh, a guy called Justin Martyr, who grew up in the same area, uh, still encountered people who were claiming that the the body had been stolen uh, about two generations later. So this, this was a very popular theory in the early days of the Christian church. Um... Now, as I said, we can't go into all of the other theories out there, um, but just pressing pause for a moment, I do think it's worth noting that the first recorded explanation uh, that, that, that comes out as an alternative to the resurrection is that the body was stolen from the tomb. Uh, because that suggests that there was widespread agreement that the tomb was empty. Um, and that does count against some of the more modern alternative explanations that are sometimes thrown out for the resurrection. Um, so uh, one would be that the disciples hallucinated, it, um, or, or that perhaps uh, they never intended to be taken literally. They were speaking metaphorically about um, a, a spiritual exaltation of Jesus that took place in his soul. Um, but if that was the case, then uh, nobody would have been arguing about whether or not the tomb was empty, because it wouldn't have mattered and somebody would have been able to produce the body. Um, But that older theory, um, that the disciples stole the body, that's still pretty popular today. So um, I was speaking to one uh, young man not that long ago, and um, he said that for himself, um, the the counterclaim to the resurrection that he found the strongest was the possibility that the disciples, or maybe just some of the disciples, uh, were trying to pull off a hoax. Um, that they're trying to, to gain some religious prestige in this small Christian community by hiding the body away and pretending that Jesus had risen from the dead. Um, and at first glance, if we're kind of used to looking for natural explanations first, um, then I think the stolen body theory does sound more plausible, um, if we're honest about it. Um, we had a group of um, 
free English classes here a couple of weeks ago, um, and we were looking at the Easter stories with all of the students there from different nationalities. Um, and as we came to this explanation um, that the body was stolen by the disciples, every single student on my table um, from, from all kinds of different countries uh, thought instinctively that that was a more likely explanation than somebody rising from the dead. But I want to suggest um, that the more closely you look at the stolen body story in its own right, the less plausible it appears. Um, Because for it to ring true, we're going to have to accept several claims. Um, So if we just look at verse 13 and, and think about what it implies. So first, it implies that the terrified disciples who we know fled when Jesus was still alive and they thought there was a hope that he might kind of become the king of Israel, suddenly now decide to face up to armed guards after their hopes have been dashed and Jesus is dead. That's the first thing we we need to accept. The second is that a group of professional soldiers who, who are going to get punished with the death penalty if they fall asleep and who number uh, in a number, you know, anything from four to 16, all of them fell asleep. And all of them fell asleep at the same time, so they couldn't wake each other up. Um, Third, we have to accept that they were asleep enough that when a group of men uh, came and moved a 4,000 pound, two sort of ton stone up out of its rut and pushed it to the side and then slowly and casually unwrapped a body and carried it off, that none of them woke up, even though it was happening right next to them. Um, But at the same time, we need to accept that even though they were asleep enough for that, they were awake enough to know who had done it. But not awake enough to be able to stop them from doing it. Um, Then, we have to accept that, that despite knowing the crime and knowing who the criminals were, nobody seemed to show any interest in hunting the disciples down, arresting them, and recovering the body, even though that would have really been quite helpful to squash the rumors that this Jesus had risen from the dead. Um, And uh, maybe just one last one, I'm sure we can think of others as well, but we have to accept that the, the chief priests who really wanted the body guarded somehow became very forgiving and didn't want the guards punished when the body went missing. I'd suggest that that just starting there, the stolen body explanation for the empty tomb just isn't plausible in its own right. But is the claim that Jesus was resurrected any more plausible? Um, Well, Mike went into that last week. I'm not going to cover all the ground that he did. I would encourage you to listen to his sermon from last week. It was an excellent one. But, but, But here are just a couple of reasons that I personally have found the resurrection more plausible than the alternatives. Um, So first, just the sheer variety and and quality of the eyewitnesses. So we've got multiple New Testament writers reporting at least 10 different resurrection appearances involving men and women, uh, groups and individuals. Um, But what really strikes me is they don't tell identical stories. Um, That the the details are sometimes hard to fit together. That that when you read them, there are still questions that get left unanswered for us. There are still things that, that are hard to fit together. And for example, what exactly did happen when Jesus rose? Nobody reports that moment because nobody saw it. Um, And I think that suggests the eyewitnesses were authentic, that they weren't trying to come up with one all-encompassing big explanation for everything. They were just sharing what they'd experienced. Um, And also, and I find this the most compelling, there's the absolutely extraordinary transformation in the beliefs and behavior of the disciples themselves. And so no monotheistic Jew in the first century would ever have worshipped a human being, let alone a crucified human being. And yet the first Jewish Christians suddenly started worshipping Jesus. And they suddenly give, gave him the, the title Lord, which is the title you give for Yahweh. And those terrified, cowardly men, they become like lions. And they, they start sharing a story 
that actually is to their disadvantage. A story that leaves them to lose their homes, possibly lose their families, to, to get persecuted, uh, to get ashamed, in many cases, to be executed. Lots of people will, will die for something they think is true, but how many people will die for what they know is false? Uh, the big bang of, of bravery and unprecedented belief, I think that demands an explanation. Um, and uh, a Japanese novelist, Shusaku Endu, has said that if you don't believe the resurrection, uh, you're forced to believe that what did hit the disciples was some other amazing event, in kind, yet of equal force in its electrifying intensity. And I've not yet come across an explanation uh, powerful enough to explain that change in the disciples other than the resurrection itself. Now, um, just to go back where we started, I'm not claiming that we can know for certain that Jesus rose from the dead in the same way you can know something scientifically for certain. Uh, and personally, I'm actually naturally a skeptic. Um, like many churchgoers, I haven't always found the claims of the resurrection easy to believe. Um, I've been on a journey uh, as a Christian with my own questions and doubts. Uh, but I am convinced that when we don't rule it out as impossible to begin with, uh, and we don't try to apply a standard of proof that we would never apply to any other historical event, the resurrection is not only plausible, but it's more plausible uh, as an explanation for the empty tomb than the most popular explanation in those early days, the most popular alternative. And I believe that it happened. If, um, if you're a Christian today, maybe sometimes as we say the creed, there are points at which you waver. And, um, and maybe you wonder sometimes, do I really believe this bit? Can I believe this bit? You're not being gullible to believe that the resurrection took place. You're believing something that's weighed and reasonable, something that's more plausible than the best alternative explanation that could be come up with at the time, and when you say the creed next week and we get to that bit where we say the third day he rose again from the dead, you can say it with confidence. We can say it with confidence. Um, and if you're more skeptical, um, can you see that at least the resurrection is more plausible in its own right than the earliest known alternative explanation, at least if we're willing to set aside the, the pre-standing view uh, that God can't possibly exist? Um, are we willing to go just a little bit further and sift the other claims and the other um, alternatives for ourselves to start sifting between the fake news and, and the good news? Um, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to grab that book at the back, uh, Rebecca McLaughlin's Is Easter Unbelievable? It's a great read. It's got 10 really good pages on this subject. And we still have some copies. We'd love you to take one. And if you'd like to, please chat to Mike and I as well. We'd always be up for a conversation about the resurrection and the claims around it. Love to do that. Um, but much more briefly, um, when we do come to consider what to do with the empty tomb, plausibility isn't the only thing that matters. Um, as well as asking uh, which explanation is more plausible, uh, Matthew's account presses us to ask, how will I respond personally? Because the, the response of the guards and the chief priests I think it reveals that our response to the resurrection it doesn't just depend on what we think in here, but it depends on what we desire and want in here. Um, so if you look back at verse 11 again, um, it's striking. Um, the, the women and the guards run for the empty tomb. They, they both leave that scene. They've both felt the earthquake. They've both seen the angels. They've both heard the words, he is not here, he has risen. And yet, whereas the women would lie worshipping at Jesus' feet, the guards end up just telling lies about Jesus. And if you take the chief priests in verse 12, and they've heard nearly the same message that the disciples hear, um, that the disciples heard from the women. So, so one group, though, is delighted by that news, 
and the other group decides to suppress that news. The guards and the chief priests couldn't have had better information about the resurrection. They didn't need to ask if it was plausible. They knew that it was. But they still didn't turn to Jesus with trust. They still didn't worship him as the risen Messiah. Why? And when I was at um, university, um, I uh, was quite a young um, and keen Christian, and I convinced my, my best friend at the time uh, to finally read Mark's gospel with me. Um, and we sat down in his room um, in this little window seat, um, just by the window, and um, I remember him saying to me, because uh, I was pretty crestfallen at the time, um, look, I'd only believe what you believed if Jesus turned up in front of me and proved himself. Um, but then just a few weeks later, he kept reading Mark's gospel, which, you know, um, are all to him for that. Um, we were talking about Jesus' call for, uh, to, to follow him, the call to, to come uh, take up your cross and, and follow me. And my friend, he was really honest, and I've never forgotten what he said after that. He said, even if Jesus did stand in front of me, I'm not sure I'd want to believe. It would mean losing too much freedom, I mean losing my autonomy. For him, believing it was too risky, regardless of whether it was plausible. Um, and I think that's what's going on with the people in our passage today. So, so the guards won't own the truth of the resurrection because that would mean giving up in verse 12 a large sum of money and being left without protection from the governor and so losing their livelihood and possibly even their lives. Uh, and the same is true perhaps uh, for some of us here today, I don't want to assume, but, but maybe it is that even if we thought uh, Jesus rising from the dead uh, was more plausible than alternative explanations, we're afraid to make a, a personal decision to follow the risen Jesus, to go all in with him, because following him might mean a big change in our lifestyle, a big change in our priorities. And can we really go that far? Um, and the chief priests, they, they couldn't accept the resurrection either. They just had Jesus killed. Uh, so their reputation and their authority was totally on the line. If they started to admit that maybe Jesus had risen from the dead, God had risen him from the dead, and that would have meant losing face and losing credibility. And that might not be so distant from our own experience. It might be that we'd be known as free thinkers and skeptics for years. And letting go of that now would seriously dent our credibility in the eyes of some of the people we know. For the guards and the chief priests, in the end, the question wasn't only was it plausible for them to believe, but what were they willing to believe? Perhaps if we're honest, we're worried that if we accepted Jesus rose from the dead, went all in, that we'd lose too much. And Jesus did say, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. But Jesus also said, whoever loses their life for me will find it. He said that if we try to hold on to control of our lives, we'll end up losing our lives and losing our soul. But if we let go and we trust him, We'll gain life now, intimate life now with the risen Jesus and eternal life to come. And if he's risen from the dead, that is a promise that he can keep. And it's a promise that many people here are experiencing him keeping right now. We will gain far more than we lose. It won't even be close. The resurrection is plausible, more plausible than the original alternatives. And for any willing to respond, it's not only true news, it's very good news let's pray Father we thank you for the resurrection of your son Jesus Christ from the dead help those of us who are wavering to see its plausibility and decide where we personally stand so that the resurrection of your son might not just be news that we've heard but very good news to us and for us today and tomorrow and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.
The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. Let's stand to sing. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life with growing faith and lasting hope. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.